Again, my name is Matt Roof, and I'm the Director of Economic Development and Community Resiliency with Thomas B. Miller Associates. And uh, I won't tell you how long I've been working in economic development, but that's why I've got a few gray hairs. The, uh, we've, been, we've been working on opportunity zones across the nation. We're very excited to be in Aiken. We're working in Montana, Maryland, Ohio, Kentucky, uh, Indiana, and uh, other parts, matter of fact, in the Southern Carolina Alliance as well here in South Carolina. This is very important meeting for us. We do a lot of research and I talk to a lot of people about uh, real estate values, investment opportunities, but we want to make sure whatever the city proposes, what we propose but for, on behalf of the city together collectively represents really interests of residents, neighborhoods, and businesses in the opportunity zone so that they see, that they realize their opportunities for investment in the right immediacy, immediate to them uh, and that uh, they can have some really great change occur, we think, with this program. While we introduce, I think, Tim introduced everybody, the most important people here in the room locally. I do want to acknowledge and give a shout out to uh, U.S. Senator Tim Scott. Uh, it, this, the Opportunity Zone program, or the concept of the legislation, has been around for about three or four years. The other co-sponsor, besides Senator uh, Scott, was Senator Cory Booker of New Jersey. Both of them supported it. And it took several years, but uh, President Trump, maybe it was Senator Scott whispering in his ear about a real estate program he couldn't pass up uh, to a man who knows a lot about real estate. So it's very exciting. It was put in the, 19, or the 2017 uh, tax overhaul bill near the end of the year in December. It's taken a while for the states to go through the process of designating them in 2018. And now uh, the opportunity comes full circle now to try to put together uh, projects that represent the interests of Aiken as well as what the marketplace and investors uh, are able to do on behalf of Aiken and the, uh, the community here tonight. So the agenda that you have should have been on all your chairs, but we're doing just brief introductions. Jack Woods, the project manager, is going to give a thorough rendition of the uh, the details of the program, and that'll be about 15 or 20 minutes. And then, then I hate to have people come out. I need yours. The next step will be up to me then and up to you. And that is we've got some very brief exercises, but we want to really hear from you about interest <coughs> in your neighborhood for the kinds of development and how then to prioritize those uh, investments should they uh, be able to align and, and put them together. So. We'll have a presentation, sort of formal presentation by Jack. We'll you know, I'm happy to answer any questions after that. And then we'll, we'll do a couple of short sessions just to get feedback from you to understand what the interests are in the neighborhood. Are we assi setting up projects as we're looking at real estate opportunities that fit the interests of the community as a whole? And that's what we certainly want to represent in the prospectus and be able to market to investors and developers in a month or two of coming forward. So, Jack? Awesome. Thank you, Matt. Um, sorry, everyone. I'm a little bit under the weather right now, so that's why I have my bottle of water. If I cough, that's, I'm just getting over cold. Um, but thank you all for coming out tonight. I really appreciate everyone taking the time. It's good to see a few familiar faces and then a lot of new faces. I'm excited to explain the opportunity zones and the incentive to everyone. Um, Tim wanted me to make sure I pointed out that we do have refreshments over here and anybody feel free to get up at any time and get those. And then also uh, we printed out a large map of the Opportunity Zone as well today. Um, so feel free as we're going through this presentation if you really want to see the area that it covers to get up and go uh, take a look at that map. So we have had a few technical difficulties today with the projector. Um, we're on the TV. I hope that this clicker works, otherwise I'm going to have to have Matt flip through my slides. Um, I can do it all. <laughs> but I want to take 15 to 20 minutes just to go over the incentive so everybody's on the same page and understands how it works. Um, there we go. Um, so the first slide here, we have Aiken's Opportunity Zone. It's a little bit small on the TV, um, but we have the census tract number. I think for all intents and purposes, we can refer to it as census tract 400. 
those last three digits. It's also um, on the back of the agenda. It is. If you flip your agenda over, you can see the, the map as well. That might help. But it covers most of the north side of the, of the city, um, extends west a little bit, um, really just north of downtown Aiken. Uh, pretty, pretty large area. So the projects that, that we're talking about um, a little bit tonight, uh, that we've been talking about in the city and a lot of the stakeholders in the community, uh, they're all in this area. So as Matt mentioned earlier, this was um, enacted as a piece of legislation in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act passed right at the end of 2017. It was a bipartisan effort by Tim Scott and Cory Booker. Um, essentially, the goal is to attract investment to distressed communities. Um, and I'll, next slide, I'll kind of explain what the criteria for distressed communities are. Um, but these places are all census tracts, so that's how the boundaries were designated. Um, just kind of overviewing a few things. Um, oh, I guess it's on this slide. Um, so, so what determines those distressed census tracts are poverty rate, so of at least 20% or greater, um, and then median family income. Uh, those, are the, those are the two factors that decided which tracts um, were distressed. Governors were then allowed to nominate 25% of the distressed census tracts in their state to be opportunity zones. Um, after they made a list of, of the tracts they wanted to be zones, they submitted them to the U.S. Treasury um, for certification. And uh, once the Treasury, Treasury certified the census tracts, they became official opportunity zones. Um, and that's why we have the one in Aiken. As I mentioned earlier, that is to encourage economic development in places that, or in recent history, haven't really seen it. Let's see if I can get to my next slide. Matt, I might need you to, to give me a click. Oh, there we go. I got it. Um, so where, this, where did this idea come from? There is an estimated anywhere between three to six trillion dollars of capital gains unrealized out there just floating um, on corporate books, on individuals' books. Um, but the real investors are probably going to be high net worth individuals just because of the way that the incentive works. Um, the two main things that it offers to these individuals um, on specifically capital gains is a 15% reduction in deferral of the capital gains tax they would have to pay. And that deferral goes until December 31st, 2026. Um, and then the big, the big one right here, the big incentive, and what most investors are interested in is the permanent of exclusion uh, of 100% of future gains. And I will explain that in more detail, um, I think, in the next slide. But before we get there, I want to cover what exactly qualifies as opportunity zone property. Um, it's a little broad. It can be newly issued stock or partnership interests in an actual business, or it can be tangible business mm -hmm. property. Um, that includes real estate, and that is a significant play um, with the incentive. A lot of investments are, are funneled towards real estate right now. So getting a little more into detail with the incentive itself, as I mentioned, it's really three uh, different incentives lumped into one, the gain deferral. So let's say that I am an investor and I have a $1 million capital gain. If I invest that into an Opportunity Zone project, I can defer the taxes that I would pay on that million dollar of capital gains until December 31st, 2026. I believe on a million dollars, that would save me about $200,000 right there. Or, sorry, I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't have to pay that $200,000. The next thing is if I hold my investment in the zone for five years, I reduce what I pay by 10%. So I'd only be paying taxes on $900,000 of that million. If I hold for another two years, bringing the time period to seven years total, uh, holding my investment in the zone, that steps up to a, another 5% another to a 15% deferral. So in that case, I'm gonna be paying taxes on $850,000. I think I did my math right. Um, that payment is due on December 31st, 2026. So they will have to pay some capital gains tax, but it will be reduced. And then like I mentioned earlier, the big part of this is the permanent exclusion. So let's say I put that million dollars into um, multifamily residential development in Aiken's Opportunity Zone. Let's say I sell that property and get another half million dollar capital gain, I would pay no taxes on that. So that's what really encourages investment into these distressed census tracts. 
um, is that incentive on, on capital gains. So to kind of put this into other terms, I have a slide here that shows the benefit, advantage of an opportunity zone investment compared to a traditional stock investment, assuming that investment is held uh, over 10 years and also assuming a 7% annualized return uh, after taxes. So you can see um, stock investment, that time period you're looking at a 32% gain, whereas with an opportunity zone investment, uh, that gain would be 73% what I initially invested. So um, it can be very enticing to, to the right types of people. So I want to dive a little deeper into the specific types of property um, that qualify for the, to receive these investments. Um, one I mentioned earlier is the tangible property. Um, this is real estate. Um, one kicker here, it doesn't have to be real estate, it could be machinery uh, used by a business. But uh, the kicker is it has to be used in an active trader business. Um, another thing with qualified opportunities on business property, it must <coughs> commence with the, or it's, it, it must have original use by the fund or be substantially improved. So what I mean by that is I can either go out to an empty piece of land and build a building up, or I can purchase uh, maybe a vacant building in Aiken's opportunity zone. Um, but if I do that, I have to substantially improve it, meaning I have to raise the assessed value by half. Um, what that does is make sure people aren't just coming into the community, buying buildings to get this tax break, and then leaving their money there, and not doing anything with the properties or doing anything to benefit the community. If you don't mind, can you repeat that statement you just said? Yeah, um, so the substantial improvement requirement makes these investors actually have to um, invest in the communities. They can't just buy a piece of property and use it as a tax shelter. They actually have to put an improvement in. So if I bought a building that was vacant for $100,000, I'm an investor, to qualify for the incentive, I would have to put in at least another $100,000 in upgrades. Is that quite a um, And then another thing I need to mention is it only qualifies if it is acquired from an unrelated party. So two business partners can't exchange properties or family members can't uh, transfer a property from one person to another. Um, I believe that's in there just to prevent artificial capital gain. Um, if I had a property and sold it to Matt and realized the gain, they don't want me uh, putting that back into an opportunity zone project and then and getting the incentive. So opportunity funds, I think I've used this term a little bit, and these are important to understand. Um, an opportunity fund is the vehicle or corporation that is set up to invest in zone projects. And any investor has to uh, funnel their capital gains through one of these opportunity funds. The legislation is supposed to be pretty deregulated, so setting up a fund is pretty simple. All you have to do, any, let me back up a little bit, any taxpayer can set up their own opportunity fund. And all you have to do is uh, fill out form 8996 through the treasury. Um, and then submit that. The Treasury certifies you as an opportunity fund, and then uh, you're eligible to get the incentive if you're investing um, in qualified opportunities on property. Um, there are a few things that they want to make sure that these funds are doing. One is that 90% of assets uh, must be held in qualified opportunities on business property. So there's a little bit of flexibility there, uh, about 10% that can be used to pay for fees um, if you have a fund manager. That sort of thing, but the majority of the fund's investment has to be an opportunity zone property. Um, and then another uh, little bit of leniency, 30% of the funds can be invested outside the zone. Um, so if you look on the back of your agenda, you can see Aiken's Opportunity Zone. If I'm an investor, um, say I have a million dollar fund, $700,000 would have to be in the blue shaded area, but I would have a little bit of leeway if I wanted to do um, another something, a separate little project, or some of the ties to my opportunity to <coughs> outside the zone. Can you tell me why the, it, it appears that something has been... It's a little bit cut out. Yeah. So every opportunity zone is a census tract, and those don't really change. Um, the census, every 10 years, they count all of us to figure out population. Uh, that's how they get those boundaries. Um, so it's not like somebody just said, I want this to be the opportunity zone. That's just one of the census tracts in Aiken that happens to be low income and um, 
met the requirements to become an opportunity. <coughs> um, and then the governor of South Carolina submitted that, and that's how it was selected. Yeah, that's a question that comes up a lot. The, the boundaries are a little funny, and uh, people always ask me to change. You know, they're, they're hard and they're set in stone. Yeah, that being said, I was concerned about why there's part of the historic district of Holland Avenue area that's not included in that. And I know there's mixed, there's some big homes and mm -hmm. obviously small homes. So, in that area. So the question is, why is that included? I, yeah, I was just, it was just well, a lot that they included that area. Yeah, it just falls within the census tract, and that tract meets the requirements when it comes to median income and um, uh, median family income and poverty rate. And that's the part that's like industrial? Yeah, that part is where all the warehouses are. So the income ratio meets the criteria. Yep. So let's move on to the next slide. I want to get through this so you guys have a chance to do the, uh, the activities and provide some input. Um, one of the things that we're exploring with Tim is this idea of creating and the city is the idea of creating a local fund. Um, there are both external. Most of the funds are external. So an example I like to give is PNC as a fund. I believe they've raised about hundred million dollars to invest in affordable housing throughout the United States. There are some that are very specialized. Maybe. There's a member of the community who creates a fund to invest in a specific business venture. Um, a best practice that some communities have implemented, not very many uh, at this moment, is creating a local fund that is more mission-driven. So let's say that um, we get done with this process and we identify some projects that might not be as attractive um, in terms of the return they would generate to some of these external investors. Um, we're exploring the idea of coming up with like a local fund that would be people who probably from Aiken or Aiken County who are committed to seeing the success of the community who would like to invest their gains um, and, and with a local group who would be managing the fund. Um, but with the idea of kind of making some of these more difficult projects possible, if that makes sense, and that could complement the funds that come in externally. Um, that idea is fairly young, and so we'll be exploring that towards the end of the process, but, but wanted to, to include that. Um, this, I believe this will be put on the city website, Tim. Um, if you guys want to go look at the presentation, you can click on that link, and it shows not all, but a lot of opportunity funds that have been created to date. You kind of want to see the types of projects they're investing in, the areas in the United States they're investing in. It might be helpful. So, um, I think we're getting close to the end, but there were some, I guess the first legislation was passed at the end of December uh, 2017. It took all the way until October 2018 for the first set of regulations to come out, clarifying a lot of questions that investors had. Um, so, the reason I mention that is because um, at, at the early part of 2018 and even into 2019, investors have been a little bit slow to take advantage of this just because the federal government wasn't completely organized when they put the legislation out. So they released uh, the first set of regs in October of last year. That helped clarify some questions about real estate development, which has kind of been the bread and butter for investors so far in Opportunity Zones. But it still left questions kind of on the business side of things and how an investment in Opportunity Zone business would work. Those regulations were released in April of 2019. Uh, they did provide a little more clarity on what qualified as a business. Um, initially, it said the first regulations or the first legislation said that a business had to do pretty much all of its, had to generate all of its revenue inside an opportunity zone. And for most businesses, generating their revenue in one census tract is not very feasible. They have a wider footprint than that. So the new regulations address that. Uh, Tim Scott was actually very adamant that that needed to be changed, and it was. Um, so there are three things that qualify, that make a business a qualified opportunity zone business. One, at least 50% of the hours that its employees work are spent within the opportunity zone. 50% um, of the services, based on the amount that's paid for that service, um, are occurring within the opportunity zone. Or the tangible property um, of the business or the management functions of the business are housed in the opportunity zone. So that makes investments in functioning business is a little easier uh, for investors. 
Um, another thing that these new regulations clarified was the treatment of unimproved land. There was a question as to whether I could go buy um, just a vacant parcel of land. If I'm an investor, put my money there and get the tax advantage. Uh, the Treasury came back and ruled, no, you can't. Um, if you buy unimproved, just greenfield land, you have to do something with it and use it in an active trader business. So again, just trying to reinforce that this is supposed to improve the communities where the investments are coming to. And then another one is a confirmation that investors can buy and sell um, their assets within the opportunity zones uh, throughout the duration of the incentive. Um, one of the big complaints <coughs> by the developers and investors are, I don't want to have to hold my one single project uh, for 10 years. So that's just not necessarily feasible for most developers and investors. So as long as I keep reinvesting in projects in opportunity zones, I can buy and sell properties or businesses um, really as much as much as an investor wants. So that will keep uh, th that will essentially keep deal flow going throughout the life of this incentive. Um, so to wrap this up, just to put this into a little more context, why Matt and I are here and why we were hired by the city, there are 8,700 opportunity zones in the United States, and most communities aren't doing anything with those zones. Um, investors are mostly located in the big cities, your Chicago's, New York's, LA's. They're not familiar with the Aikens of the world. Um, so this process that we're going through, ultimately we will key up some projects, put those in an investment prospectus, and then work with Tim and the city uh, to help market to some of these funds, showing that we've done the work, um, there are projects in the community that make a lot of sense, and that Aiken is a great place to invest money. Um, most places aren't doing that, and most opportunity zones will likely be overlooked. Uh, so just one other thing I want to point out, I guess that goes back to communities need to take a proactive approach to stand out. And then um, this last map here, uh, also shows context for why the incentive was important and why um, Senator Tim Scott and Senator Cory Booker wanted to get this legislation passed. If you look at that map, everything that is tan or uh, it basically anything not blue uh, has seen business decline since 2017, which is most of the map. Um, so this incentive really hopes to kind of reverse that trend. So uh, just a few key milestones here um, going forward. Right now we're at the top one, phase two, our community meeting, that is today. Uh, the next step for Matt and I is to go back to Indianapolis, finish up this prospectus and have that delivered um, in October. Um, after we do that in October and November, we will begin working with Tim and the city to engage uh, potential investors or funders. And then we are in contract through December to assist with technical assistance um, as needed, <coughs> maybe in some conversations with developers or investors. So I believe that is the conclusion of my presentation.